Let's just have a word of prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we are very concerned about the truth, the truth that you have given us in your word, and also the truth that we can discover as we go through life. Truth is very important because we know that the alternative, the alternative are lies, and the father of lies, we know who that is, Satan himself. We want to follow truth and we want to follow you because you are the author of truth. I pray that you will help each one of us understand this important difference as we speak this morning in Jesus' name. Okay, what's the alternative? Where did this title come from? Well, those of you who did the, um, the survey that went through um, a little while ago now, we've had these statistics gone through with uh, the uh, uh, surveys that we have from time to time. In 1996, 74.6 people actually reported that they were religious, they went to church or they had a religion. In 2016, it was 60.4%. In 2021, the latest one, it was 53.8%. You can see that things are dropping. Just last week, there was an interesting interview with this man, John Anderson. Some of you will remember John Anderson. He was the Deputy Prime Minister a while ago. And uh, he was interviewed on Sky News. And this is what he had to say. Former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson has called on those dancing on the grave of Christianity to explain their better alternative amid an increasingly broken up and divided Australian society. The Australian Bureau of Statistics on Tuesday released data from the 2021 census, which we just showed you, revealing how the number of Australians who are not religious has increased further, those who do not accept any form of religion. Now, those things that has just been stated by John Anderson, everybody can see, can't they? We can see how, how society is fragmenting. It's fragmenting over how many different issues. There are literally dozens of issues, but there's some important ones that we can see happening it's fragmented over COVID. It's fragmented over vaccination. It's fragmented over um, abortion. It's fragmented over, um, in America, uh, guns and so on. Um, and so we see the society being split everywhere into often two camps, sometimes more than two camps. And we look at those who are offering alternatives to uh, Christianity and we have to ask ourselves some questions. What John Anderson said is we're seeing a decline in adherence to Christianity down to 44%. That's a very savage drop, Mr Anderson said. The big question that arises is what are the linkages then between the other things the census tells us about? We know that mental health is now the number one health concern. We have unparalleled levels of anxiety, depression and self-harm amongst our young people. Increasingly, our society looks frankly more fractured, less trustworthy, more broken up, more divided along identity politics lines, less coherent than ever. So my question to those who are dancing on the grave, as they think they are of Christianity, what's the alternative? Where is your better way? I think that's a very good question. And we're going to try and unpack that a little bit. So what are the reasons that people give? And we find this often in the media, but even in your conversation. Um, people will give reasons for why people are no longer going to church. People say, well, Christianity is irrelevant in our modern society. They might say that religious differences are the cause of many conflicts and wars. Some say Christians are hypocrites. They don't live what they preach. Some would say, well, I can make my own God in my own imagination. Some say that the Bible is outdated and full of myths. 
Some would say that science has proven that ev evolution is true and that there's no room for God. And some might say that religion is just too restrictive on my lifestyle choices. So we could ask the question, well, is Christianity or Christian values irrelevant in modern society? Let's look at it. What does modern society value? Well, now, we could do our own survey right here and now and say what you think modern society values, but I think up near the front of the row would be this word, freedom. You know, there's the Statue of Liberty. It was actually sent by the French government to the um, New York governors, I guess we'd call them, or to the United States to celebrate the fact that the United States was accepting refugees from wars and trouble in Europe from all over the place to come to the United States where they would be free. But we have to ask ourselves the question, freedom, what does it mean? Freedom from what? Or freedom to do what? It was clear with the American situation that it was freedom from oppression. And, of course, America was founded by the Pilgrim Fathers on freedom of religion and religious practice because they had come from places in Europe where they had been savagely repressed and, uh, and were under a lot of uh, pressure to change their religion. So they came to the United States to practice freely their religion. And we think, well, that's a good thing to be able to do, to have freedom of religion. The opposite of freedom is what? Slavery, yes. Um, that's like the absolute opposite of freedom is slavery. And, of course, uh, Paul the Apostle was very... Um, au fait with what slavery was all about because it was very common in his day. Do you know that there are now more slaves in the world than there were in Roman times? Were you aware of that? Forced labour in some third world countries is rife and there are literally millions of people who are being forced to work. So freedom can mean lots of different things. Some people believe that freedom should allow me to, to think whatever I like. Now, I guess that's probably acceptable. We should be free to be able to think what we like. What about to say what we like? Well, now we might come into some issues here because when we start saying things, particularly in public, there might be opposition. But nevertheless, in a democratic society, generally speaking, we're allowed to say what we like or used to be able to say what we liked, but not so much anymore, particularly on the media. If you try to say something on the media that you believe to be true, more, or, more often than not, I'm talking about social media, you'll get some negative responses. In fact, you might get a lot of negative responses depending on what you say. And start mentioning religion and you'll certainly get some. What about freedom to do whatever I like? Well, in the United States, they believe in freedom to go buy a gun. Yeah. Are you then free to go into a school and shoot up a dozen or more children? Is that freedom? Maybe not. I don't think anybody would say that that's a kind of freedom. This man, Peter Marshall, was chaplain to the US Senate between 1947 and 1949. He didn't last very much longer than that. Uh, but he was a, a very famous fellow insofar as his wife wrote a book um, called A Man Called Peter. 
And that was turned into a movie in the 1950s called A Man Called Peter. It was quite an inspirational Christian movie about this man and the way he uh, presented the gospel in the US Senate. And he had this to say about freedom. May we think of freedom not as the right to do as we please, but as the opportunity to do what is right. And I think there he's reflecting and uh, uh, putting in other words what Jesus himself would have said. And this is what Jesus did say. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Therefore, if the Son of Man makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So that links truth and the Son of Man together. They cannot be separated. Truth and the Son of Man, or Jesus Christ himself, can never be separated from the truth. But we have to ask, what truth are we talking about here? There are lots of different truths. I can say that... Um, two squared equals four, that's true. But that's not the truth Jesus was talking about. So the Apostle Paul had this to say about freedom, liberty, if you like. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. So now we have to look at what Paul is doing here because he's putting a contrast. He's saying, well, here's freedom and here's bondage. And everybody that heard him speak or read that in his day would know exactly what that meant. Bondage was, you're a slave. Freedom was, you were a free person and you could move around and do things as you wished within the law. Freedom, therefore, what was Paul talking about? And what was the bondage he was talking about? Well, we know where the bondage is. Because people who think they're free still are not aware that they are not always free. In fact, most often are not free. Because they are bound by habits and circumstances and things which cause them to do what maybe they don't really want to do. There are not too many slaves who really want to be a slave, I would imagine. But people become slaves to themselves and to other things and other people even by their choices. For example, you can start taking methamphetamine and before long you're no longer free of it. You're stuck with it. You will probably not shake it off without a lot of help. You might be free, you think, from uh, the problems of drinking, but if you keep drinking, sooner or later it's going to bind you down and you'll find it very hard to escape. But what about not telling the truth? Can lying be an addiction? I think it can be, particularly if it has secondary benefits from telling lies, such as you might decide that scamming somebody in the internet is going to earn you a lot of money. It's all lies, but I'm going to benefit from it. But eventually you will be bound by your lies. So we ask ourselves the question, freedom from what? Or freedom to do what? We've already said, well, is it are you free to go buy a gun and shoot people? Well, not really. However, some people think that they are. Ellen White had this to say about liberty, which is just another word for freedom, and it's quite profound. The liberty that is promised to the transgressor of God's law is rapidly becoming libertinism. Profligacy, murders, suicides and other crimes are increasing at an appalling rate. On the one hand, God has given necessary laws of restraint. On the other hand, ministers who claim to be Christ's ambassadors have belittled God's law and with a persistent zeal have imitated the father of error 
and rebellion in boasting of their glorious liberty, liberty to break the law. Obedience to the claims of Jehovah, they persistently urge, is a yoke of bondage. So here are ministers who should be proclaiming the freedom that Paul proclaimed from the bondage of sin. They're actually doing the opposite and putting people back into bondage. That was in her day. Certainly not any better today. So let's go back to modern society and see what modern society values. Because if we're talking about a Christian-based society and an alternative, we have to look at what people really want, don't we? <laughs> Let's see. Here's a list of those compiled by a committee in the UK called NICE, the NICE Citizens Council. It was published in 2014. Um, and it, it was there, it was a body that um, were, I guess, uh, um, chosen by uh, the politicians and it was made up of members of public, broadly representative of the adult UK population and it operated through a citizen's jury style of meeting to explore and respond to a question that was set by this group, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence called NICE. And uh, in its meeting in May 2014, the Citizens' Council considered the question, what are the societal values that, are ne that need to be considered when making decisions about trade-offs between equity and efficiency? Sounds like some bureaucrat wrote that. <laughs> but they came up with this list of the things that they think uh, make an ideal society. Accountability, collective responsibility, dignity, education, fairness, honesty, humanity, individual rights, justice, maximising total benefit and benefit for most, utilitarianism, quality of life, respect, right to health and welfare for all, safeguarding the vulnerable and value or quality of service. OK, so where do these things actually come from? Do they just come out of the air or have they got a basis somewhere? I think we might have a look at that. Accountability. Where does accountability come from? Well, I'd like to put it to you that it actually comes from the Bible. And this is what it says in Numbers 32, 23. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. In other words, you are accountable for your sin. Either soon or later, or eventually, one will be accountable for sin. Accountability is a biblical concept. Collective responsibility. What did Paul say in Romans? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, as a race, if you can call us that, or as a group of human beings of all races, we've all done wrong. We've all fallen short of the glory of God and it is a collective responsibility. What about dignity? Remember the story of Mary who was washing the feet of Jesus and uh, with her tears, in fact, and putting that precious ointment on his feet and wiping his feet with her, her hair? What was the response of those who were around her, including the disciples? Did they increase her dignity? Not at all. Who increased her dignity? It was Jesus himself. And what he said was, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. So the gospel and Jesus dignifies people. That's where dignity comes from. True dignity. What about education? This is from Deuteronomy 4.9. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. That's true education. 
There is, I think Ellen White says that there is no higher education than this. What about fairness? Did Jesus deal with unfairness? Did Jesus demonstrate fairness? This is that story which you can read in John 8 verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, remember this was the time when the woman in adultery was being stoned or was about to be stoned. And he said, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. There's a bit of fairness for you. That's where fairness comes from. What about honesty? Well, we don't have to ask much about that. What does it say in Exodus 20, verse 16? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. Don't tell lies. What about humanity? Humanity seems to be a very big thing and amongst this group, important for society. Luke 10, 36 and 37 says this, So which of these three do you think was neighbour to him who fell among the thieves? Remember, this is the story about the man who was beaten up on the trail and two high-ranked Jews went past and a Samaritan then attended to his wounds. And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. That's humanity. That's exactly what it is. What about individual rights and justice? Is there much said in the scripture about justice? Well, there's an awful lot said in the scripture about justice. But this is a, a, a wonderful summary, and I think Pastor referred to this verse uh, um, a sermon ago in Micah 6 8. He has shown you a man what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's justice. What about maximizing the social benefit? for most, and safeguarding the vulnerable. Did the scripture have anything to say about that in the days of Israel? Um, did they have social justice? Did they safeguard the vulnerable? Well, according to God and the scripture, this is what he said in Deuteronomy through Moses. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger the fatherless and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. And it didn't just apply to the sheaves of grain, it applied to grape harvest and the other uh, harvests that you would leave. And when they actually cut their fields, if it was a square field and they went around uh, reaping the field, they'd leave the corners unreaped so that the fatherless and the widows could come in and... Uh, help themselves um, to what was left. What about quality of life? Now, there's been this um, criticism that Christianity is so restrictive. It restricts my quality of life. Does anybody here feel restricted in their quality of life by being a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist? Not me. I don't think anybody else does either. And Jesus had this to say in John 10.10, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And he didn't just mean eventually in heaven, but he meant right here and now. Respect, we're coming down toward the end of that list of things. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. So respect has to be earned, does it not? Respect has to be earned, and those who do not earn respect do not get respect. And that's basically what this scripture is saying. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud. What about right to health and welfare for all? 
This is what it says in John 3.17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? So the idea of the health and welfare for all is a Christian concept. So we've been talking about Christian society and how Christianity affects society, and then we were going to talk about the alternative. All of these values that I've just gone through and given you a scriptural text, and you could think of many other scriptural texts as well, are listed by that secular body, that nice body. They have their origins in the, scripture, in the Christian scriptures, all of them. So what are some of the other objections that people or reasons that they give for the decline in faith? First of all, that Christianity is irrelevant in modern society. Well, let's look at that. This is what he had to say, uh, John Anderson. Increasingly, our society looks frank, more frankly fractured, less trustworthy, more broken up, more divided along the identity politic lines, less coherent than ever because of the decline in Christianity in Australia. And we've seen this before, but I'm going to highlight a little bit here. The question he put was, to those who are dancing on the grave as they think of Christianity, what's the alternative? Where is your better way? So what are the alternatives? We could look at a few. How about atheism? Do away with God. We don't need God, they claim. Well, here's one atheistic government. And according to Human Rights Watch, the North Korean government uses prison camps, torture, forced labour and threats of execution and arbitrary punishment to maintain fearful obedience among the population while restricting North Koreans from travel out of the country and communication with the outside world. And they're not the only ones, but they're a pretty prime example. That's where atheism leads Maybe radical Islam is the answer. This is modern Afghanistan. When I say modern, only a month ago. Um, do you see a lot of freedom there? <laughs> Not really. Um, but who do they call upon when disaster strikes? I think that answers it, doesn't it? So there are alternatives that are available to our society that can put Christianity aside, but do we really want them? Perhaps we could try anarchy. Now, you would almost think that it's not too far away, even in democratic societies. This is Sydney in the last three years. Protests about pretty well everything. <laughs> and if you let everything of those things just run riot, you would end up with anarchy, with no order in society at all. Um, and not only that, but the different groups in anarchist situations, because they think that their particular program and idea is the number one, and this one, nah, no, that's not so important, what happens? They clash. And you end up with a clash society and usually revolution. This is America today. Unfortunately, a lot worse even than here. What have we got? We've got problems with black people being killed and then protesting. We've got immigration issues, uh, border issues. We've got now the change in the law. Uh, well, it would appear that the change in the law from the Supreme Court about abortion, and we've got those protesting against it and for it. 
um, uh, we've had so much issue. They've got the issues of, of COVID as well and vaccination and non-vaccination, et cetera, in America. And more or less culminating in this, which we saw not long ago, when the unthinkable happened and they invaded the capital. What about the idea that religious differences are the cause of many conflicts and wars? Well, in a secular sense, I don't think that we can deny that. We have to admit that it is true that religious differences, wherever they might be and for whatever reason they appear to be, have been the cause of conflicts and wars. And interestingly, Christ had some quite interesting things to say about this. He said in Matthew 10, 34, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Well, that sounds like something that needs a bit more explanation. Wouldn't you agree? Because he also said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So when Christ talks about peace, he's referring to two different kinds of peace. Peace on earth, he admitted, as he did about uh, the poor, who he said you will always have with you. And the scripture tells us that wars we will always have with us. So he said, I didn't come to bring that kind of peace. I came to bring a different kind of peace, a peace that's in your heart, a peace that frees you from the bondage of sin. But nevertheless, there's a bit of a conundrum here because in Hebrews we find this statement, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, the sword is not a symbol of peace. The sword is a symbol of war, if you like, or division at least. And here, um, Paul the Apostle is saying that the truth, although it may make you free, will also separate you from others. He was just echoing the words of Jesus where, he's, where Jesus said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You know, that was one of those sayings which I think um, some of his followers might have called a hard saying. A hard saying. But we need to remember that he is talking about eternal things. He's talking about really important things that if you stay in a relationship where there is antagonism to the truth or there is uh, untruth being spoken, eventually something's got to give. Either you separate from that or you will be affected by that. And he also said this, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. So that's something different too. He's saying you've got to pray for those who oppose you. So here's a question. In that context, what he just said, Love your neighbour and uh, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. How can real Christians go to war? That's been a very, a question that's been pondered a lot. Can a nation call itself Christian and still go to war? Is there any such thing as a just war? What about Christians are hypocrites? They don't live what they preach. This so-called Christian is responsible for this. Is it any wonder 
that the average person, when they look upon Christianity as a whole, starts to think, well, there's so many Christians who are hypocrites. They say one thing and do another. Christianity has been given a bad rap over the years because of those who claim to be Christians and then completely deny what Jesus taught. Completely deny what he taught. Remember what he just said? Love your enemies. What about this claim? I can make my own God in my own imagination. Well, that's happening quite a bit. Here's one. And you can think of a lot of others, can't you? These things and people and actors and influencers and other people are becoming gods in their own imagination and in the imagination of others. Anything that separates us from the true God is a God in my own imagination. What about the Bible being outdated and full of myths because science has proven evolution? So they claim there's no need for God because things happened. They just happened. No need for a creator. The main myth, of course, is about creation. This is what a leading Anglican churchman, the Reverend Malcolm Brown, said back in 2008. He said the Church of England owed Darwin an apology for the way his ideas were received by the Anglicans in Britain in his day. In Oct on October 28, 2014, we're getting a bit more recent, Pope Francis says evolution is real and God is no wizard. In delivering, delivering an address to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, Pope Francis continued his habit of making provocative, seemingly progressive statements. The pontiff appeared to endorse the theory of the Big Bang Theory and told the gathering of the Vatican that there was no contradiction between believing in God as well as the prevailing scientific theories regarding the expansion of our universe. Interestingly, I think I took a sermon some while ago when um, I mentioned that the person, the first person who actually formulated the Big Bang Theory was actually a priest. I don't know how a priest can formulate the Big Bang Theory unless he doesn't believe the Bible. And what about this? There are lots of people who are saying this. Religion is just too restrictive on my lifestyle choices. You know, it's, it's clashing with this and it interferes with that and I can't do this and I can't do that. And particularly with regard to sexual practices, I think that's a very common one, and also re with regard to other practices such as drinking and drugs, etc. These are just a few examples of the lifestyle choices that seem to be impinged upon by Christian, by Christian lifestyle. But let's have a look at these. Um, all of these are, in a way, a form of addiction, are they not? A form of slavery, are they not? A form of something that means that it will separate you from God. And Proverbs says this, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Its end is the way of death. And that's so obvious in so many lifestyle choices we see today. What about this? There's a statement which um, is probably true. Well, certainly true. Loss of faith is inevitable for some people because the Bible says it would be. Paul the Apostle said this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, which is part of the uh, Bible reading we had. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. What day was Paul referring to? 
Well, if we go back to verse 1, we find the day he was referring to. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So he's referring to the coming, the second coming of Jesus. And what was the falling away then? Notice it's not a falling away, it's the falling away. So it's specific, it's not general. Falling away from what? What is the result of falling away? It results in the man of sin being revealed. So have we had a falling away from faith? This is a question that everyone needs to ask themselves. The statistics prove it in terms of our community. We've had a falling away from faith. There's no doubt about that. Even the politicians acknowledge it. What will inevitably follow? And this is the text that we've been reading. For that day will not come unless the falling away. I'll go back. And just come down to that again. Sorry, I've gone too far backwards. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So the falling away will be from the word of God. Clearly, that's what uh, Paul was referring to, in favour of the commandments of men. Now, uh, was that falling away happen in Jesus' day? Absolutely. That's what he said to the Pharisees. You're teaching the, for doctrines the commandment of men. So the result of that is that they were worshipping in vain. This man, Marsilius of Padua, in the 14th century, believed that the only authority for a Christian is the Scriptures instead of the Pope. The same point was made by John Wycliffe, which we've heard of before, who first shadowed the doctrine of sola scriptura in the 14th century. Um, these two men uh, both were excommunicated, by the way, funnily enough. The authority of the Catholic Church relies on three pillars of faith, the sacred scriptures, sacred traditions, and the magisterium, but not in that order. So the Pope claims for the Catholic Church the power to interpret scripture and publish Catholic dogma, and individual Catholics are said to be free to interpret scripture for themselves. Here comes that word freedom again, but hang on so long as it doesn't conflict with Catholic dogma. All right. <laughs> mm, bit of restriction of freedom there, I'd imagine. Freedom to interpret scripture just doesn't exist. But didn't this falling away occur centuries ago? So what falling away just before the coming of Christ did Paul refer to? because he's referring to us in our day. Is it God's chosen people falling away? Is it us as a church? Is it me and you? Is it me and you? This is what the psalmist has to say about that. For you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? And this is what is the answer to the falling away. Cling to Christ. Cling to him. With every power of your being, Cling to Jesus. There'll be no falling away if you cling to Christ. And we're going to sing this very soon. So let's have a closing prayer and then we'll do after our final hymn just that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have 
put to us many tests as we have studied in the lesson uh, this quarter. And we recognize that there is a great risk that individuals, churches, companies, communities, nations can fall away from you. That is not what Jesus came on this earth to do. He came to reclaim, to prevent the falling away, to give us the hope that with his power and strength, the falling away will not occur, not amongst those who love Jesus. We know there will be a falling away. We know that that will reveal the son of perdition. We know that that will herald your coming soon. We can see this happening. We can see it happening in society. We can see it happening in churches. We can see it even happening around us, perhaps even in families, even in our own families. But Lord, help us to be able to witness the truth to all who will hear and that that falling away may be minimised amongst those who love you. For we ask it in Jesus' worthy name. Amen.